This was like 2013. I was working in New York. I'd been there for a few years with my family. And then I got the call from this woman called Christiana Figueres. And she said, look, I've got this thing I've got to do. I've got to bring the whole world to common agreement on climate change. Are you interested in being involved? So we had 195 countries that had to come with ambitious agreements, right, to Paris. And we knew that there were a significant number that were not really getting on board with what they had to do. So my role was to find ways to persuade them when diplomatic approaches were unsuccessful. So I built a network of hundreds or thousands of companies, people, religious leaders, business leaders, investors, and others. And we would utilize this network to help the diplomatic process be more effective and encourage national leaders that this was the moment for leadership. I couldn't tell anyone I was doing this. So I would sit in the negotiation hall, and one of the countries would say something that would put a spanner in the works of the negotiation. I would get a nod from Christiana, and I'd put my system into work, and I'd call somebody who would call someone else, who would call the minister, and then we'd watch the position of that country change in real time. And no one knew. Now you've given away the secret of how to right. work behind the scenes. What else can we learn from <laughs> in terms of preparing the ground for what, frankly, is going to be, I think, an, an equally difficult COP, especially when we've got, apparently, leaders of the free world actively starting to um, you know, argue against it. Right, so Paris had all the countries sitting around together, everyone had to agree, and then it was gaveled through as a decision. There are small things that need to be agreed in Glasgow, but the main thing that needs to happen is each country actually needs to improve their nationally determined plans mm. and then come to Glasgow with those plans. So the way the Paris Agreement was structured was that there was a long-term goal to get to net zero by the middle of the century and that countries would come every five years with plans of increasing ambition to get us onto that trajectory. And that's the mechanism, right? That's the international mechanism that was the breakthrough that was the Paris Agreement. So this is the first test yeah. as to whether that's going to happen. Now, one of the reasons why it's more difficult is because we have a much more difficult political landscape since then, right? You know, the idea that countries can come together and do big things together is less trendy than it was in 2015. The UK government has a massive diplomatic job and they can learn a lot from what the French did in 2015, right? This is a whole of government, everyone outreach, all ministers, all embassies. The other thing I would say is given the reality of the geopolitic and the national governments, it's really important to focus on everyone else in society. Yeah. So it's really important that part of COP is businesses, cities, investors, regions, you know, mm. to open the doors of that process to ensure we can go as far as we can. And the reason why that second bit is so important is because the logic that as is at the basis of the Paris Agreement defies um, the attitude that we had before of... Uh, you go first, and then maybe I will follow, which is exactly what we had before. And the Paris Agreement really turns that completely on its head because the Paris Agreement is not, uh, it is not a top-down imposition of what needs to happen in each country, but rather it's very much of a bottom-up invitation for every country to identify what path, what social, political, economic path that country wants to follow in its own view um, and in its own vision for the future and then to register that under the Paris Agreement. And ultimately, if we remember the spirit of the Paris Agreement, that should not matter because it's not about who is doing what and let me see, but rather, what do I want? And most countries have understood that yes, of course, this is about a global need, but more immediately, it is about self-interest. It is about cities that are more livable. It's about public health that is much better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list is long. Mm -hmm. Acting on climate change and reducing the intensity of carbon in the economy is not acting against our interest. If it were, we would not be able to do it. It is actually an accelerant of our interests. And so in as much as we can get, and I think that is where the work of the British government needs to be from here until then, to remind everyone that we are not looking over each other's shoulders. We're not looking at this as a burden 
Yes, of course, it is a shared responsibility, but beyond that, it is an opportunity that most countries should not miss on. We are just about to flow over the guardrails of what is manageable in society, in the economy, and in fact, in our physical infrastructure. Now, the amazing thing is that before 2020, the technologies that are the solution, for example, renewables and all of the other technologies, we really didn't have them at competitive prices. We had invested in those technologies, but they were not yet successfully ingrained in the system. Today, they are. Secondly, we do not have the capital accumulation that we have had since 2008. We have a capital accumulation in the markets that can really be shifted quite quickly if we decide to do so. And thirdly, we were only experimenting with the policies. So today, for the first time in human history, we have the technologies, the finance, and the policy that if we align them all together, we can get to 50% emissions by 2030. Before 2020, we could not have done it, but after 2030, it's going to be too late. Our children can do nothing about that. It is about these 10 years, it is these 10 years in which we are actually determining the future of humanity and of the planet. So no pressure, <laughs> just let's get it done.